good we should be live for everybody that is tuned in to another episode of weight room overtime and as you can see today we have a special guest one of my good buddies that i work with working with and lives in tucson just like i do and he shared a story with me going to college playing sports uh, the man is a legend out of the college that he went to, he has some great stories, but I'm not going to take too much of his, you know, his shine from the from the video today. But um, welcome to another episode. Like I said, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, and today's episode is really just to for you guys to understand how, you know, different, you know, di people have different paths to make it a college or make it a pro playing a sport. And today we get to hear Don Jennings, the John uh, Don Jennings here, sorry, um, experience of not only growing up in Tucson, but how he made it out of Tucson to play at, at a collegiate level. So, Don, floor is yours. Hey, I wouldn't say a legend, <laughs> but your boy played. Oh, boy play. <laughs> I played some ball. <laughs> so, Don, tell thanks, us, tell thanks us where you're from. Me. Yeah, tell us where you're from. From the Tuck, Tucson. Tucson, Arizona. All right. Born and raised. Yep. And then, uh, what what high school did you go out of here? Because I'm not from here, so everybody does not, I guess, familiar with you know Tucson. Well, uh, so I went to Mountain View. Mountain View. So for people tuning in from Washington, I know we have like 4A, 3A, 2A, as far as like you know levels of you know school, as far as how big it is. How big is it in compared to Arizona? Because I know you guys have a little bit different. Um, how does Mountain View? Work? It was 4A at the time. Four yeah, a. it was 4A at the time. Yeah, now they're like um, 5A, one of the bigger, the bigger schools. But it was like the northwest side of town, uh, the suburban um, uh, school. Uh, not a lot of black folks. Um, so I was one of one of few uh, uh, black kids in the the entire school district playing. Um, whether it was um, you know, football, basketball, or running track. Would you say uh, this school was majority of a football school when it comes to sports? Or what was kind of like, the, you know, the sport that, mo you know, there's always that one school in, in the district that's only good at wrestling, for example, or only good at soccer. I know soccer was probably big down here, too, because all the Mexicans. But uh, what would you say that Mountain View High School was uh, predominantly strong at? It got known as the football school because they won the state title when I was a freshman in 94. So we had guys, um, you know, like Gabe Cox, we had Kevin Schmicky at running back. Um, you know, Gabe Cox played wide receiver at Purdue with uh, Drew Brees. Um, so that team um, was everything. Everybody's compared to that team. Every running back was compared to, um, I'm sorry, it was Kevin Schmicky. I think I said Gabe, but it's Kevin Schmicky, um, you know, number 34, you know, running, running, breaking records, you know, scoring touchdowns. Um, that was the, the team that put Mountain View on the map. Because Mountain View started playing football in like the, the mid or late 80s. You know, the school was relatively new in that time. Um, so, um, you know, coming up, I played um, Pop Warner on the south side with you know the mexicans the, you know with the other black kids um i didn't play with the kids that i went to school with um because i wanted a chance to actually play so would you say you so, would you say you were like a minority at the time at at you know the schools that you went to or um mm -hmm. so talk, talk to us about that experience oh, yeah. though. like how, how did how does that kind of relate to not only i guess your performance when it comes to playing football but as far as like the way that people perceived you when it came to, you know, maybe being a star or, you know, going on to college and stuff like that. Because I'm sure we have people, you know, in different mm -hmm. areas of the world or different parts of the country where, hey, there could be a minority at the high school that they're going to, right? So they might be overcoming the challenge today as far as like, hey, I'm the only Mexican at this high school and I'm playing soccer, for example. And now they're expecting that guy to be good just because he's Mexican, right? So how, do, how from a mindset, from, from, you know, thinking about it now when you were an athlete at the time, you know, was your focus like, hey, I want to make it a college, or were your focus just like, hey, I'm just trying to do good at this game, or did you take it game by game, or how, how does that kind of relate to, you know, your success when it came to, you know, sports? So when I started out, I just wanted to play. 
I saw the commercials on Pop Warner, and then when I started playing, I saw the kids that were really good. Um, so when I was in Pop Warner, you know, I had a team teammate, um, you know, Anthony Nelson. Um, I had a teammate, Cliff uh, 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 Moten. Um, those guys were like the fastest kids in in the town, right? So I played I played quarterback. My coach wanted me to play quarterback. I played quarterback all the way through Pop Warner and all the way to high school. Um, and then when I got to high school, I didn't get one sniff at quarterback. I lined up with the quarterbacks at practice, and I didn't even get my name called. Um, that was like for the, the JV team, because I didn't even play freshman football. I played uh, Pop Warner all the way to my, my sophomore year. So I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about you know, college at the time. I was just thinking that I was good in Pop Warner, and I'm going to take the next step to be a quarterback in uh, high school, but that didn't happen at all. So you would you say you played running back the whole time? I didn't play running back. I sat on the sidelines pretty much moping for a year. Yeah. Um, I got in a couple of JV games on, you know, kick return and on a punt return. Um, I showed some flashes, I would say. Uh, I was really small. Uh, so how did so, you might change a little bit? Um, mm -hmm. Was there a time in your career, like time in high school, you kind of felt discouraged just because of the amount of playing time, or you know, you sat on the sidelines for a year and you know hardly got any playing time? How did you keep a you know positive mindset when it comes to you know not getting enough playing time? Because I'm sure there's a lot of kids out there that maybe are not you know on the level they should be competing at, where they're again they're sitting on the sidelines or you know getting twenty. 10 minutes on playing time, right? How, how did you keep a positive mindset for those who, you know, might be going through the same struggle you did at the, at the time? I didn't keep a positive mindset. So growing up, so I went to elementary school with Tamani Joyner. His nephew um, is on the uh, Wildcast now, uh, Jamari. Tamani was the man. He went to Amphi. Um, he ended up playing at Oregon for the Ducks. Um, we would be playing football on the playground, and Tamani was the man. Him and uh, Walter Jefferson growing up, those were the guys. Um, and you would see them bust 80, 90 touchdowns in, in high school. So my, um, I think it was my junior year, and I, the coach that won, uh, Coach Jones, I'm not going to say um, how all that goes, but uh, so we got whooped by, um, by Amphi, the school that Tamani went to. Um, my senior year, and I went up to him and I said, "I'm not, I'm not good enough to even get in the, the game." After we had lost, we got blown out, and I went up to him as a, a, a kid, 140 pound senior, and I went up to him and said, "I'm not good enough to get into the game." And he said, he looked at me, "I'm not going to talk to you about this right now." Oh wow! But before that, my dad didn't let me quit. You know, my dad is uh, was a teacher. He taught school in uh, Nogales, uh, which is about an hour south of Tucson, um, right on the Mexican border. Um, he taught on the reservation. Uh, he is from Mississippi. He's from the south. He grew up in the civil rights era. He, he kept me from quitting. I wanted to quit every single day. And he told me one time, do you want to be a, a loser sitting in the stands watching the games? He wouldn't let me quit. So um, it was my junior year, and um, my coach, Somerset, his uh, son, Justice, is a high jumper at the U of A right now. Um, and he's like all world, all, all Pac-12 right now. Uh, coach Somerset uh, wasn't, wasn't easy on me. I was just sitting on the sidelines moping the whole year. And I jumped in there at fullback to, to run a trap play during practice. Yeah. Um, and he looked at me as somebody who was just messing around, you know, just standing on the sidelines. And he said, you know, Jennings, you got one chance. And it, it, he said one chance, like, or he, it, he was just done. So ran a trap play, scored a touchdown. And then um, he looked at me, and I'm standing in the end zone, and he's like, run it again. 
And we ran the same play. They knew what was coming. Ran the trap play again from fullback and um, scored again. And from there, I was, I was uh, running back. You were on from there. Like 100. percent So you, it you was all. You had one chance, and then you basically took advantage of that chance and kind of turned your playing time around. It actually changed a lot. From that point forward. My dad in that, yeah, my dad in that, that play, and so, um, from there, you know, my dad taught me, you know. We always tried to be like, like Tamani. Like Tamani was like world class speed. Like catching, hawking people in the four by four hundred, in in track meets. Um, I saw it myself. Um, I was never that that fast, but I, you know, wanted to model my game after that fast. You know, speed running people, outrunning their angles or juking them. So my dad would help me with the juking. You know, I watched Barry Sanders. So um, my senior year. Uh, was like at the bottom of the um, the depth chart. Like there were so many people in front of me. Like I, I wasn't even playing until people got hurt. People got kicked off the team. Some of my best friends got in trouble. Got kicked off the team, and then um, got a chance against Choya, and you know scored a touchdown. And then um, you know against Catlin Foothills scored two touchdowns. And uh, I was 140 pounds as a, as a senior running back. <laughs> yeah, you were tiny. Um, but um, scoring touchdowns. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got to the last game of the season, and nationally ranked Sabino. Uh, they had you know Brian Polly Dixon. You know, they had Chris Stark, who we worked with. Chris Stark, um, Brady Doe. I don't even know how I remember. You know, they, they had a, a guy, a, a running back that went to Cincinnati. His name was Nathan Wise. Broke all these records. Um, so we're playing them. And the coach, the head coach before the game, told my buddy who got kicked off the team, he said, what are you guys going to do? You guys got Sabino coming into town. And the coach says, um, what are we going to do? We got Jennings in the backfield. So um, I heard that before the game. I drank some, uh, we, you know, we used to meet in the auditorium before the game. I drank me some Ultimate Orange <laughs> before the game. Uh, Try to get myself, you know, pumped up. Um, this team was a juggernaut. And we weren't, we weren't going to the playoffs. Um, uh, so we, um, I, took, I took the opening kickoff maybe five yards, and they, um, they tackled me at like the 10. They were, they were so good. But the, the um, second play of the game, I took it 89 yards. Um, right up the middle of a blast play, um, outran um, everybody. Um, then the next time I touched it, I took it um, 89 yards. So the first one was 80 yards. The second one was actually 89 it's yards. Crazy. Both it's up, crazy how you still remember every blast. single play from, from that time. It, I had to take it. I used to watch it's, the tape. It's been so long. But, <laughs> but I think that's what people remember me um, for. Those big games. That's why. So. Yep. Because it was like packed stadium uh, for that that one. So you're you're at this point, right, where, you know, you kind of turned around. You ended up getting some playing time. So when does the, the thought about college come into play as far as like, hey, I want I actually I think I have a shot. Or how, how does that you know, start with you because everybody's different, right? Whether you were already getting scouted or did you already have in mind some schools that you wanted to, you know, go try out or, you know, whatever it may be, right? Walk on. Did you, you know, have to fail a couple was, times before yeah. you actually made it to a team or, you know, kind of explain a little bit about, you know, that situation because it does come a point in time and mm -hmm. I experienced this myself of figuring out, hey, I know I'm capable or, you know, eligible to play in college. I just don't know what school I want to go to. Um, you know, from my experience, I had you know, a couple offers, but it really nailed down to also where my friends were going that I also got recruited. Some of us had yeah. similar offers. So, you know, kind of walk us a little bit about your situation and, and, you know, how did you go about it? Everybody from my school was going to uh, Eastern Arizona, the JUCO um, in Thatcher, Arizona, which um, had just come off of a conference championship 
and um, in recent years, maybe five, re re really recent, they're one of the top JUCOs in the nation. Um, if you guys watch, um, you know, Last Chance U on Netflix or, or things like that, that's the, the kind of program, a JUCO, you know, where you're, you're not going to a Division One, you don't make the grades, you're not good enough. Uh, that's where you go. Yeah. Um, so towards my the end of my year, it was such a high having that success on the field mm -hmm. that I, you know, I, I wanted to see where I go. I ended up being a, a um, an honorable mention um, all conference with, uh, and I used to know this by heart, but the guy that started before me, before he got kicked off the team, I had a hundred less carries than him, but over like like the same amount of touchdowns. Yeah. So that's that's like where I was like, okay. So I started sending out tapes to you know small schools, and since everybody from my school was at going to Eastern Gate Cox, um, you know Shane Rogers, those guys those guys were going to. Um, Eastern, I sent them a tape, and then they sent me a letter back asking, inviting me to walk on. And when I got that letter, I was like, I was going crazy because somebody had asked me to be on their team, even though it was a walk on. So I called my friend Barry, and I was like, oh, yo, I got the stock, got the letter, dog, I got the letter. And he was like, they're asking you to walk on. <laughs> like, I didn't get it, I didn't understand. And that's the biggest thing. I didn't know the game. My, my dad, my dad wasn't um, an athlete. He was a chess, you know, ping pong um, science teacher. Um, he did, we didn't know. Like you didn't have the, guide, like you know, workout. Right? Like somebody did before you. Not like a big right. brother in a sense, right? Uh, right. We didn't have. We didn't know the guy. We didn't know the workouts. We didn't know anything. You just knew what um, they taught you in high school. That's pretty much it, for the most part. I knew what my dad taught me. And I knew what I saw from, you know, people I played with. So, and, um, yep. so after, after you getting a walk on, and, and so just for the people that, you know, don't know what specifically that is, maybe they do or they don't, right? So you're, let's say you were, we're talking to high schoolers today, right? They're watching this. A, a lot, like you said earlier, where, you know, you got that excitement, even if it was just a walk on, I think. There's, there's something to put out there because a lot of people don't even get that. You know what I mean? There's there's so many football players out there. There's so many, you know, athletes. They're all competing for one single spot on a 22-man roster or a 30-man roster, right, whatever it may be. Um, I know football is a little bit larger, but they're, you know, nitpicky about who they choose that's going to come on in their team because there's a great, you know, great talent out there, right? So even if you have to walk on, tell us about that experience because – some people might be like, oh, well, it's not worth it. You know, it's not worth it to go walk on at this school and I can go play, you know, full time at a smaller school or whatever it may be. Right. So, what, you know, from your experience, what do you have to recommend for somebody that might be, you know, in that same ballpark as you were, you know, they're looking at these schools and some of them are inviting them, you know, to come try out or whatever it may be a visit. What do you recommend? Because, you know, it could it, it's different from when you went to compare it to now. Right. When it's. A lot of social media, yep. a lot of this other stuff. Like, what do you at, at that time, right? In, in the nineties, it, it's way different than it is now. Right? Even just life, right? So, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about that. There, so there is no huddle, HUDL. There is no um, video database for coaches to go dive in and get players. There's no mixed tapes that, that people can post online. We were up there cutting up our own VHS tapes of our highlights to send out. We would put music on it. We would send it out. I remember when I was like, man, if we would make money if we would uh, put, we would make people's tapes for them and then send them out to coaches yeah. and then it, then Huddle comes out. Uh, but there's a place for you if you, wanna, if you want it. There's a school out there where you can go live out your, your dream, whether it's, you, whether you get the scholarship or you walk on. 1% is going to make it anyways. Yeah. Out of all the college guys, 1.5%, I think, um, is going to make it to the NFL. And that was the dream I lived on for a yeah. long time, that I, I was trying to make it to the NFL. And if that's your dream, do it. If, if your dream is just to play college football, do it. But it could, it could change your life. You can network. You can find a job. You can meet your, your future lady. 
Um, but, you know, what I would tell kids now is 1% is going to make it. You have to find to what you want out of it. So yep. a lot, I know there's a lot of parents that watch this as well. Like the kids are, you know, you know, in their teens, they're going to get to high school. And at some point, this conversation is going to come up. It, it comes up for every parent that has athletes in their mm -hmm. household, right? So from a parent standpoint, obviously, you already shared a little bit about how your dad, you know, wasn't so much of a football player, but he had other areas that he was good at. Um, for those parents that are maybe, you know, have a son that's playing football when their parents never played football or understand that aspect of it, or even just a specific sport like tennis or anything like that, and they don't know anything about tennis, they just, their son loves it, so they support him, right? There's a lot of the parents like that, and that's okay. What would you say to the parents the most important thing is, besides the support, right? Because I think you know that earlier, there's, there's a lot of preparation that has to be done within the high school age, even, you know, to college sometimes, where sometimes it is training, right? You were a smaller, you were a smaller dude, right, playing in high school until you made, you know, the big changes up, up, up at the senior year. But imagine if you had some training before then where you could have been better prepared during those times in high school, right? So what would you, what would you say, you like, from a training as aspect, do you feel like you were, you know, put up for success early on or did that come into, like, college later later in life as far as, like, hitting the weight room, going through an actual training program, maybe specialized training? Because I know there's a lot of specialized training now for football players where, they want to work on speed work, so they go to a speed coach or they go to a track and field coach to get, you know, work on their 40 or their sprint time. How was that experience for you at the time growing up compared to when you got to college? Because obviously those are two different things, right? Because when you're in college, it's more competitive. you got to have that, you know, you know, training aspect, strength and conditioning coaches. Um, so how, how does that experience for you? Obviously, let the coach coach. And speed kills. Speed speed is the ultimate factor if you if you're if you don't have the speed you're not going to make it to college if you don't have the speed you're not going to make it to the pros and that's what kept me from from getting at least a a, a bigger sniff at the pros was the, the speed aspect um when i got to um eastern i showed up the first day as a walk-on and I, 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 well, I showed up to the, the uh, check-in, and head coach Tidwell, who went on to go coach at Louisiana Tech after he left Eastern, um, he told uh, you know, one of the top DBs in the conference, Isaac Banks, to give me a ride down to the locker room. And you know, got into a pickup truck, and I'm riding down there with him, and, he, and I asked him, you know, how hard is it for a walk-on to make it? And he said, he didn't even know me. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm not going to even lie to you. It's really hard. But I didn't quit. Um, I did my walk on year, set, you know, watched the games. I wasn't even allowed to stand on the sidelines, right? Yeah. Um, did the workouts. The workouts were like a Nebraska workout. Um, so we did the high, um, high weight, lower reps, low rate, low weight, high reps. Um, that got me on the, the right path was the workouts yeah got stronger but that, um, that didn't happen until you way. got into college right right until it was forced for you to perform better and with performance you need strength um yep. so for parents out there a training an annual training program for all your kids when they come to a teenage years even before if they're going to play you know sports it's imperative as, as don mentioned earlier speed is probably the indicating factor that you're going to make it far if, if you at least if you have speed you're going to yep go pretty far even with soccer like if if you weren't very technical if you weren't very good on the ball but you had you know you were fast as hell running down the sideline they're gonna play you at some point because they need somebody to get tired of the other team out right so um good thing they mentioned that because from a training conditioning coach like myself whenever you're trying to you know gain max speed it comes from basic strength so you actually need maximal strength before you can turn that over to power into speed so a lot of people don't understand that. They'll go straight to whether that's, you know, doing plyometrics when they weren't ready because they didn't have the strength for it. And hypertrophy, so the reason we like to do hypertrophy is to, you know, gain more muscle size within the muscle cell. Like, for example, your biceps, you want to be able to make them bigger. Because when you make them bigger and you're trying to go for, you know, maximal strength, let's do a curl as much as you can. If you have a smaller bicep, obviously you're not going to have that strength or be able to recruit more muscles within the uh, muscle cell to be able to perform more, right? So 
just a little insight of like the way we do things this you know there's a reason behind it later on um which is something i didn't know growing up like i didn't my school was poor they didn't have a strength, strength and conditioning coach we early had not like trainer right so um and i'm sure it was the same thing for you don like most high schools don't have a, a strength and conditioning coach maybe a, most p p coaches you know put them to the weight room with the coach or whatever but as don mentioned he didn't really get specialized you know weight training until he got to college right so never did plyometric uh plyometric workout until college yeah so to think to think that i wouldn't say fell but you might not have a greater chance as you think you would or even make it as far as you think you could have as well so there is peak times as well so if you start too early you're going to peak too early in your career where maybe college is the end towards the end of that career and then there's times where people peak after college and then that's when they turn pro because they're performing at a higher level at that point right so um, when you got to when you got to community college don you went to this program you played two years there at eastern i actually i so i redshirted the first year okay and then i played my uh second year um off the off the bench like i hardly even got in okay the the times so i got in uh, one game, and, and ironically enough, Coach Somerset, the one that said last chance, he was on the opposing staff, and um, I went in for one play. We were already up by a bunch. Mm -hmm. I ran the wrong way on a blocking assignment. The quarterback threw it to me on a broken play, and I scored a touchdown. And then I never saw the field after that. So after the game, Coach was like, hey, it's good to see you play, still playing. And then, um, again... Some guys got in trouble. They weren't on a team no more. Um, so I was playing the last game. They put me in, and I scored on another pass play. So they tried to turn me into a receiver after that. Um, but, you know, my natural position is, is a running back. So um, I earned a scholarship after two games my first, my first year actually playing on the field because I stayed with it. And when I got in, I made the most of my opportunity. So, and then the coach offered me a scholarship after people that. People that don't know that, that's pretty crazy, though. Like, that's not a common thing. So, as you can tell, Don had that dedication of, like, I'm not going to quit until I, you know, hopefully keep playing, right, at the time. So, yep. um, that dude, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I didn't even know that. So, that's crazy that yep. you walked on and then got a scholarship two games later because you performed right when you needed to. Um, so, I know you mentioned something that I think I think it's pretty interesting, and I wouldn't say interesting, but I think it's more in the sense of something we can help athletes today or parents that have athletes in high school specifically. You mentioned there's a lot of people that ruin their opportunities by doing dumb stuff, right? Um, they messed yeah. up, and obviously that messed up their football career, education career, whatever it may be. Um, you know, from your perspective, because it's different in the 90s, right, or early 2000s compared to you know 2021, right? Obviously, kids have Different mm -hmm. mindsets. There's different things out there. What kind of what kind of things would you say are kind of misleading when you when you get to that? Obviously, we all been through high school, right? We played, we were athletes at the time and stuff like that. There's gonna be obviously some you know bad apple. There's gonna be some bad influencers in, in life. That's just gonna happen. But how would you say you overcame some of those things? Because I'm sure some people invited you to do things and you were just like, ah man, maybe not or whatever, maybe. Like how do you how do you overcome that and not really lose those friends or or you know make it seem like you're a wussy or whatever it may be well i was lucky well luck and then my parents um uh, you know helped me a lot um so they helped me keep on the straight and narrow especially with my grades and just wanting to play um but when it comes to like the peer pressure and all that um it's just like day one you know you can't let you know, somebody else decide your future. You can't let somebody else to dictate what type of person you're going to be. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really find myself till I got to um, that level of, of uh, you know, life, like school and getting a class and, um, you know, eventually having to get, find a job and, and all that stuff. Um, you just got to, you know, have priorities what's important to you um, yeah, 
I your think friends that, out there forever. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of the basically the key here is just to you know that that peer pressure is going to happen at some point, whether it's early on or later in your career. But I think when you have a scholarship or going for a scholarship, I think that's the only thing that should be in your mindset. Whether it's like if you mess up once, you're done. Like in college, if you mess up one time, whether that's getting a DUI, whether that's you know whatever it may be something stupid, right? Most mm-hmm. coaches are not going to keep you, even if you're you know four or five star recruits sometimes. Right, just depends on the situation, but a lot of times you're cut off that team because you're causing bad media, whatever it may be. The school doesn't, the athletic director doesn't want that. Um, so just know, stay in your lane and focus on your school. So one thing too, Don, how how much did you you know your grades translate to the scholarship or you know your your path to you know maybe going to D1 school straight out of high school like were grades a big factor at the time because obviously that's different from my era and you know the era now when it comes to school and, and athletics I'm, I I've always high. been high yeah. like, I've always want people to have high grades but how realistic was that at the time it's very realistic because I qualified right out of high school with um, my ACT and my um, SAT mm-hmm. but there are those guys that are considered like bounce backs the ones that can go D1 but have to go to junior college because they don't have the grades, or the guys who are at D1 and got in trouble for their grades, or they got in trouble with the law and then had to go back to JUCO. So I found myself playing with guys that should have been D1 Mm -hmm. but were playing at JUCO. And either they didn't make it back to D1 or they lost their opportunity to go back to D1 for any of those things. So... um, and I think it's I think it's different now because you see all these kids, especially with basketball, they're going to these. But um, I know, schools. I know, yeah, I know for football, there's a lot of uh, opportunity in the JUCO space when it comes to football scholarships because there's only some limited di- Division One or Division Two schools. How would you? Uh... Well, it's even less now because they got rid of all the JUCOs in in Arizona. Um, they phased that out for budget reasons. Uh, so there's like various leagues starting up. So I don't know. I, I think we got to see what happens because I know they're going to start paying the guys in D1 um, eventually, like in the next two years. Um, there may be some leagues that start up. I know there's the XFL that 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 started back up. I, at some point, um, the dream I, I was thinking about going overseas to playing um, football, but uh, you know, at the end of the day. The, the opportunities are limited with football, well, so, no matter you know what level you look at. So what, what would you say to some newcomer today, maybe a high school senior, who only can play in JUCO but not get discouraged because there's still some opportunity to turn that life around or you know turn his career around? What would you put, put advice would you give to them? Go f- try to get a scholarship, um, get an education, and network. Meet some people. Um, you know, get a job out of it. Share share your experience, how you moved from this Eastern school in Arizona to Minnesota. So I took the film I had. Mm-hmm. From Eastern. So my last, yeah, my last year, my third year at, at Eastern, yeah. um, you know, it may not be ideal. You know, you, you really want to burn your red shirt um, at, a, at a bigger school. But I took my, so my third year, I started. Every single game I was in, even when I got hurt, um, when I came back, I, I was the starter. I was the the um, legit starter every game. Um, I took the film I had, mm-hmm. and I started sending it around to all levels of, of school. Um, um, you, you know, the coaches, you know, every year the JUCO coaches, they, they try to do what they do. Um, I don't know what was done for me exactly. Um, but I got um, a call from what, what is now an FCS school, or I think an FCS level school mm-hmm. in, in New Mexico. Um, and they, they offered me a scholarship if their running back didn't make his grades. So the running back coach was talking, hey, we got your film, we, you know, we like what, you see, what we see. I have a scholarship for you, um, but if we're gonna see this, this guy's grades come back. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, and then, a, you know, um, a D3 called um, and said, 
hey, our running back last year was Division Three player of the year. Um, we want you to come in. But we don't offer scholarships. We want you to walk on. Um, and then, I, um, you know, our tight end, uh, Daniel Linden, who went to Catalina in Tucson, he was going up to a D2. He got an offer from a D2 at Southwest Minnesota State. Uh, so I sent film there, too. So I was kind of waiting. Um, you know, Coach um, Strassheim was saying, hey, uh, hey, we're going to look at your film. I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. And then the school from New Mexico called and said, the guy made his grades. I was like, oh, okay, do you, do, do you have a scholarship? He was like, no, uh, but you can walk on. And being a walk-on, and this is like, I don't want to go through a walk-on thing again. So um, the you know Division Two Southwest Minnesota State called and said, "Yeah, we want you. We want to give you a scholarship." And and don't get me wrong, when we say scholarship, it's like more of a badge of honor than anything. At a D one, you're probably getting a full ride, right? But at like a D two or you know something like that, it, it's a partial. You get some of your school paid for. Yeah. But it was still more than I ever thought. And more I, than a lot of people I played with. Yeah, I know what you're talking about because when I went to school, I didn't get a full ride. I got like a 65 or 75 percent. Well, I mean, it was still mm-hmm. paid pretty well, but um, it, it's not a full ride. You know, you go on school for free and playing, so you still have to work for it. You know. So. Yeah. And so, so uh, mm-hmm. go ahead. I was just saying, just went up there um, and and played some D2. And then came back to Arizona. Yeah, some interesting trivia. So, so Southwest Minnesota State is in Marshall, Minnesota. It is the headquarters for Schwann's Food. <laughs> it's all farm. It's, it's three hours from St. Paul, uh, Twin Cities, so you're not going nowhere. So it's just like all you got to do is, is play football and party. Um, that's, that's all it was. So it has like uh, a small city school feel. Because I, I went to... I went mm-hmm. to an NAIA school. I played at Eastern Oregon, and the same thing. It was hours away from the biggest city. <laughs> <laughs> like Boise was probably like four or five hours. Um, yep. Boise, Idaho, and then my hometown was probably like two, two and a half. But um, yeah, dude, the, the the only thing you could do is the only reason people came into the town was really because of athletics. Like the diversity came from athletics. There was no, you know, minorities in the town. So I have an understanding of like how to be a minority in a town that predominantly this is like not used to you, you know. So. Oh yeah, that's Thatcher. Yeah, that's Thatcher, Arizona for sure. It's crazy though because when I, I went to I went to the school. When they this was the first year they ever had a soccer program, at Eastern Oregon, and I I didn't find out till later because my coach was Latino as well, and he didn't tell me he's like, dude, guess what. They're, they're bringing a soccer program. This is where we're actually getting recruited. He's like, they're bringing a soccer team here because they need more Hispanics at the university and in the town. So they're trying to bring diversity into the, to the town. Yeah. Dude, and he recruited, like, me and my four buddies. That, you know, we were playing mm-hmm. we were playing community college together. And, like, four of us went to that school. We all got scholarships to go play. He's like, oh, you guys are the first four Mexicans I'm going to add to the team. <laughs> and they ended up getting, like, half the team Mexican and, you know, some of that mixed. But... Uh, yeah, dude, I understand what the hell you're talking about. This is so funny. And, um, I mean, there's hundreds of schools across the country like that, too. Where oh, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah we, they, were, they were bringing guys from uh, Florida. Um, when I got to Minnesota, um, so we didn't know how far it was from the airport. And I just got this, this puffy combs jacket from Ross. Like and like when <laughs> when I got out, that, that first that, that cab ride was expensive as hell because it was like a three hour ride. We didn't know how far it was from the airport. It was in nowhere. And I got out the the cab, and the the, the jacket disintegrated. It, it's like it's like it like fell apart. I had to put it in the trash like that day and go get me a Columbia. But um, it was crazy. Uh, but interesting. So, top five pick of this year's NFL draft is going to be Trey Lance. I'm thinking. That's what they're saying. So, Trey Lance's dad 
mm-hmm. Carl Plamance played at my D2, Southwest Minnesota State, uh, Carl to Lance, and he was our DB's coach when I was there. So shout out to them. I oh, didn't. No. I don't know. I don't know Trey Lance. Don't. I remember up the yeah, games, exactly. but yeah. Um, but just want to give that shout out because that was our our DB coach um, when I was there. Um, that's my only claim to fame at at, at D two. Another thing that I would tell um, kids is um, scout where you're going to play. Because, yeah, scout where you're going to play. Because I went up to Minnesota, and we played on a field that was all mud. So you're it saying was, to go do the visits before you commit to a school. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Yep. I went out of, I don't want to say desperation, but I went out of um, the want to. Yeah. Um, but if I had gone up there in the winter, and seeing that um, they didn't have turf, it was a mud bowl um, every game, um, I probably wouldn't have gone. Yeah, that's that's huge too. I wouldn't say that's huge, but it's it's crazy though because you you'll have some athletes, now, but yeah, you'll have some athletes that they only have one scholarship, right? They're only getting one shot, so they're gonna take it, you know, no matter what. But um, yeah, that's interesting how. Because we're not we're in the NIA space, right? Played the, the Cascade Collegiate Conference. All the schools in the conference, majority of them, I would say, weren't. So I don't know if you know how the NIA works, but they don't. They have a, they don't have an age limit, like the mm-hmm. NCAA does. And then also, most of those schools were in areas where you know they're not going to like Montana, for example, had a couple schools where the, you know you're not going to have. You know, thousands of soccer players coming out of their football players, right? So yeah. they they can recruit from all over the world. So when I was when I when I played, I remember playing these schools, and these were grown men, dude. They weren't like same age, like 22, 21 year olds, you know, in, in college. These were like 27, 28 year olds from like Brazil, Australia, England, you know. And these guys, like when you, when you look at a sport like soccer, right, and you recruit from all over the world besides the U.S. Dude, you're mm-hmm. getting ballers, dude. You're, you're getting people that played because soccer is huge all over the world compared to the U.S. So you're getting people that are like, man, dude, you, re- you really left Brazil to go and play here? Like, it's the middle, it's snowing, dude. It's like negative 10 degrees. You know what I mean? So it's, it's interesting, though, how, how you mentioned that. Like, those people are probably never going to come take a visit to, you know, Oregon to come see, oh, you know, I just had that scholarship, you know, lined up for me. Is, is what it you know, looks like for that. But, um, but cool, man. Well, it was a pleasure having you in the podcast today. It was fun. Yeah. And Thanks for letting me talk. For yeah, uh, it was fun. Let the, let the fans know, you know what you're up to, where we could find you, um, and anything else you want to say to to the weight room overtime fans that are listening to this, and whether that's YouTube, whether that's uh, Instagram, you know, TikTok, whatever it may be. Uh, you can find me here on this show. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't got nothing that you guys want to see other than this. So um, yeah, this is pretty cool. Old man has has dinner at three o'clock. I'm the old guy in the club. <laughs> oh, cool man. Thanks. Thanks Thank for doing for this. Joining. See you guys to the next one. Peace.